Good afternoon, everyone. There was no White House call today, but there will be one next week. Look, I know Vermonters are concerned as we see the rise in cases from the Delta variant across the nation and here in Vermont. This isn't where we wanted to be, but we need to accept that we're going to be managing this for quite some time. Unfortunately, fortunately, we built a very strong foundation uh, for defense here in Vermont. As you know, Vermont continues to have the highest vaccination rate in the nation and among the highest in the world. This is helping to dampen the impacts of the Delta variant as we see its effect across the globe. What we're experiencing is a higher rise in cases and more importantly, hospitalizations occurring among the unvaccinated. As the CDC director, Dr. Walensky said on our call last week, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Those who are vaccinated and still contract the virus are largely reporting mild or asymptomatic cases because the vaccines work and they're still our best tool to prevent the worst impacts of the disease. Because based on the modeling we've shared and, uh, and the experiences uh, we've seen in other states and countries impacted by the Delta variant, we expect cases will continue to rise over the coming weeks. This may happen even though we're approaching 85% of the eligible population. And we've seen our vaccination rate pick up over the past several weeks. That still leaves about 85,000 eligible Vermonters who have not signed up, in addition to those under 12 who aren't eligible yet. Unfortunately, that's a large enough number for the Delta spread. As we can see from our own numbers and the rest of the highly vaccinated Northeast. Recently, we've seen several Vermont employers and institutions, especially in riskier uh, settings, take steps towards requiring the COVID-19 vaccine. And I applaud them for taking this approach to further protect their employees and customers. I think this is a good idea. And I wanna thank our colleges and universities, hospitals like the UVM Medical Center Health Network, Dartmouth Hitchcock, Mount Esgusti Hospital, Brattleboro Memorial, and many others, both small and large, for stepping up. I believe all hospitals, long-term care facilities, and other places that come into frequent contact with high-risk populations should follow suit and require the vaccine. And to help set the example, I'm announcing today that my team is working to do the same starting with certain state institutions like the Veterans Home, Correctional Facilities, and our Psychiatric Hospital. A legal team from my office and the Agency of Administration is working with the Department of Human Resources and others to move forward with the vaccine requirement for these state employees. And we'll have more details in the days to come. And to other private employers out there, as we see Delta finding its way to more unvaccinated individuals, taking a, a similar step could help with your business operations as well. At a time when our workforce challenges remain significant, and as a former business owner myself, I know how disruptive it can be when you find yourself short-staffed unexpectedly. If your company doesn't have a high vaccination rate, you could see major disruptions if Delta gets in. And one good way to protect that from happening is to incentivize and require the COVID-19 vaccine. In a few minutes, we'll get our data and modeling presentation from Commissioner Pichek. Secretary Smith will provide an update on vaccine clinics and Dr. Levine will give a health update. But first, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Harrington to talk about the extra federal unemployment benefits which are expiring next month and what Vermonters can do to help prepare. Uh, help prepare. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. I do want to take just a minute today to talk about the end of these federal benefits. As many of you may know, 
Uh, the federal extended unemployment benefit programs created under the CARES Act uh, are scheduled to expire on September 4th, uh, 2021, marking the last full benefit week in Vermont for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, which is also known as the PUA program, uh, and that is the program for self-employed, independent contractors, and others who did not qualify for traditional unemployment. Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation, or PEUC, uh, which has allowed claimants in regular UI to continue to file after they exhausted their state benefits. And Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, or FPUC, uh, which provided the additional $300 per week added to each claimant's benefit check across all of the programs. Uh, to give folks an idea of the size of these programs, as of July 31st, there were roughly 14,900 Vermonters filing for weekly benefits. Approximately 5,800 individuals were filing in the PUA program. Approximately 3,800 individuals were filing in the PEUC program. And roughly 5,300 individuals were filing in the regular state UI program. This means we are expecting that about 10,000 claimants will no longer be eligible for unemployment benefits after September 4th, and all claimants will see a drop in their benefit amount when the $300 supplemental benefit goes away. These programs played an important role in providing temporary assistance to make sure many Vermonters received the support they needed through difficult and uncertain times. As we approach the end of these benefits, it's important that these, uh, those still enrolled are aware of the opportunities available to them in the job market and that the Department of Labor can help move them into the workforce before September 4th. That's why the department has been contacted uh, with claimants uh, through direct mail, email, and phone, as well as through program materials to ensure they are aware of this fast approaching date and the services that are available to them. And on the workforce development side, our team of local career specialists have been conducting direct phone calls to claimants uh, in the PEUC and PUA programs to ensure claimants are aware of the free workforce support services the department offers. We know the longer an individual is out of work, the more difficult it can be for them to re-enter the workforce. And because of this, our job center specialists and job centers throughout the state are open for in-person and virtual services, and we will be expanding the number of hours available over the next few weeks. With offices now open in person services, offering in person services in Barrie, Bennington, Brattleboro, Burlington, Middlebury, Rutland, St. Albans, and St. Johnsbury, and virtual services by appointment across the state, our local career specialists are ready to assist you with your job placement efforts and various training opportunities. There are currently more than 8,800 jobs in Vermont JobLink. And we can pinpoint the best jobs available in each region for each claimant and help make that, that important first connection for the job seeker. Our team is also holding weekly virtual workshops and events, including sessions on resume writing, reemployment strategies, and interviewing, as well as virtual job fairs to help link job seekers with employers. I encourage anyone looking for a job to attend any or all of these sessions. These services are completely free and a great way to, re to begin re-engaging with employers. You can find more information at labor.vermont.gov jobs. We know that many businesses are also struggling to find employees and looking to fill good positions. So our team is also there to support employers through talent, uh, through job promotion, hiring, event coordination, and applicant referrals. Employers can also find more information online at labor.vermont.gov jobs. We know the end of these programs could be a difficult transition for some of our very close neighbors, and at the Department of Labor, we want to help get these folks back to work as soon as possible. So please, if this applies to you and you're looking for a place to start, we're here to help, reach out, to us so we know how to get in contact with you and we can help you find your next career. Individuals and employers without consistent internet access can also contact our main workforce development team by phone at 833-719-1051. 
833-719-1051 or by email at labor.vtjobs at vermont.gov. At this time, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for the weekly data and modeling report. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Commissioner Harrington, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as the governor alluded to, cases uh, continue to increase across the country this week, with the national seven-day average rising from 78,000 uh, to 110,000 today. And looking at the active case map, we see that the active case growth continues to largely be clustered in the southern part of the country, where many of the states are less vaccinated. But these impacts are continuing to be felt in all other regions, including our own. But the data does point to some optimistic signs. First, the rate of new people getting vaccinated across the country is the highest it has been in over two months. And although cases are still rising, the rate of growth has slowed here in Vermont, regionally and nationally. And the data still clearly shows that the most vaccinated regions of our country are avoiding the worst outcomes. First, turning to the change in the national weekly case growth, we can see that cases have been rising in the U.S. over the last seven weeks, quickly increasing from 7 to 12 to 45 to 65 percent. And although cases are still increasing, the percent in which they are doing so has been declining over the last three weeks. Similarly, looking at the cases in the Northeast, we see a similar trend where cases were rising more quickly, and then more recently, that growth rate has slowed down over the last three weeks. Again, cases continue to rise in the Northeast, but the rate in which they're doing so is uh, starting to show signs of slowing down. And when we look at Vermont's numbers, we see a similar trend where cases have um, shot up in terms of the percent of growth. Uh, but more recently, that has plateaued. We haven't seen a downward trend in Vermont's numbers yet, but it certainly has so shown signs of slowing down. So with all of those um, indications being that potentially the case growth is slowing about seven or six weeks in, uh, fits in well with the next slide that looks at places around the world where the, del where the Delta variant has driven case growth. Obviously, first in India, then in the UK, but in a number of other countries, and then, of course, here in the United States as well. So this analysis looks at each of those peaks. It puts them all on the same uh, timeline. So at the moment that their cases started to rise because of Delta, that is the moment here shown as the zero date. And then we bring it forward into the future and look at what those peaks looked like in each of those countries and jurisdictions. As you can see, India, the United Kingdom, uh, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, Indonesia, uh, and also places here in the United States, including Missouri and Arkansas, where the Delta variant first landed, have all shown signs of rising for about seven, eight, nine weeks, and then reaching a peak and then declining as well. You can also see on this analysis that the United States is just outside of that zone, about seven weeks. Uh, to uh, just under seven weeks away. So with the case growth slowing in the United States, it does show indication, again, that when we get into the next two to three weeks, hopefully our cases will peak here uh, and start to go down. Uh, again, on the next slide, we talked about how the outcomes are still significantly different depending on your vaccination rate. You can see here the states that have the lowest vaccination rate, states more in the middle of the pack, and then states at the high end of the vaccination rate, with Vermont specifically included as well. So again, even though our cases are rising in Vermont, you can see the difference uh, in our case growth compared to those less vaccinated regions of the, uh, of the country. And most importantly, you can see the difference in the hospitalization rates. Again, even though our hospitalization rates are rising, they're significantly different than those other parts of the country uh, where hospitalizations have been rising for some time and are significantly higher than ours on a per capita basis. And again, even though our hospital rates have gone up, we continue to have the lowest hospitalization rates uh, in the country. And similarly, on the fatality side, you can see how Vermont, uh, with three fatalities reported so far in the month of August, unfortunately, of course, uh, still has a very low rate relative to these other parts of the country. Looking more specifically at the Vermont data, a chart that we showed a couple of weeks ago looks at the vaccination rates uh, of those Vermonters who are fully vaccinated and the case rates. 
and then looks at the case rates of those Vermonters who are not fully vaccinated. So a few weeks ago, uh, these lines were much closer to each other. Of course, the unvaccinated population always had more cases, uh, but we're starting to see that uh, split out a little bit more significantly with the rise among the or unvaccinated population rising more quickly than the fully vaccinated population. Again, another reason uh, for those who haven't done so uh, to protect themselves uh, from the Delta variant. Lastly, on the Vermont data, looking at the forecast, we see, as the governor indicated, uh, rates are expected to rise uh, over the next three weeks. Uh, again, Vermont is about five to six weeks into this growth phase. Uh, so we want to keep a close eye on those states, Missouri and Arkansas, and we want to keep a close eye on the United States rates overall. If we start to see those rates fall in the next week or two, uh, we can have more confidence that our rates uh, will peak and fall as well as we get closer to the end of August into early September. And then just an update quickly on the vaccination numbers. We can see that Vermont continue to increase its vaccination rate, uh, 2,763 people this week. That's up 12% from last week. And you can see there are now about 85,000 Vermonters who are eligible who have not started vaccination. On the next slide, you can see that increase, that 12% over last week, and the fact that cases have, rates have been going up for those seeking vaccination for about the last five or six weeks. So again, a good sign there in Vermont that our vaccination rates are increasing as well. And you can see on the last slide that that uh, means that we continue to maintain our top standing in all of these categories across the country uh, when it comes to vaccination. So again, um, even though cases are expected to rise in the Northeast and here in Vermont, Vermont uh, it continues to be the best state position to withstand this Delta variant rise. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to cover the various walk-in vaccination clinics that will be open at schools and other sites across Vermont this week. But first, we have seen, as you have seen on the chart, an increase um, in, uh, in number of cases, but we've also seen a demand in testing for some parts of the state, particularly in, in Chittenden Chittenden County. And although we have a robust daily testing capability throughout the state, we have begun to leverage our EMS personnel at certain locations where we have seen heavier traffic. We are adding hours to the Pine Street Testing Center in Burlington and opening a new testing location in the Burlington District Office. This should help us meet any increased demand for testing. Just remember, testing is free and easy, so visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to find a testing site. So when should you get tested? If you have any COVID-19 symptoms, get tested in quarantine. If you, have, if you are unvaccinated and have a known exposure to someone who is suspected or confirmed to have COVID, quarantine and then, and then get tested at day seven. If you are fully vaccinated and have a known exposure to someone that is suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19, you are protected. If you do not have any symptoms, you do not need to quarantine. If you like to be reassured, consider getting a test three to five days after exposure. Turning to vaccination rates as of today, as Commissioner Pichek had talked about, 84.6% of eligible, ver eligible Vermonters have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 75.4% of all eligible Vermonters are fully vaccinated. The vaccines are safe and highly effective at preventing the most serious effects of COVID-19, including against the Delta variant. From our nightly reports, we have seen that most of those who are getting the virus in Vermont are unvaccinated. And so the sooner you, that you and, or your eligible family members get a first dose, the closer you'll be to becoming fully vaccinated. So again, please take the short amount of time it takes to get vaccinated. Although we do see cases where people get COVID-19 that are fully vaccinated, these instances are far less prevalent if you are vaccinated. Plus, vaccination makes cases less severe and often they are mild. Given the rise in cases, especially among Vermonters un unvaccinated, and given that just over 85,000 of eligible Vermonters still haven't been vaccinated, we are ramping up our efforts both at the school level 
and generally. We also want to support schools across Vermont to get to an 80% vaccination rate. Starting this week and over the next three weeks, there will be vac vaccine clinics in schools across the state serving all districts. Clinics will continue in schools over the next two months. If you are 12 or older and haven't gotten vaccinated, getting your shot now is a great way to get ready to go back to school. If you are under 18, you can register online or walk in as long as you have a parent or guardian and have the appropriate parental consent forms. It's quick and it's easy. You can walk in and get vaccinated at most local pharmacies as well, including those in grocery stores. You can also visit various pharmacy locations at the University of Vermont Medical Center, the Community Health Centers of Burlington, the Northwestern Medical Center, and the Southwestern Medical Center. In addition to these options, here's where you'll find 38 pop-up and school-based clinics just this week. Uh, today, Manchester Elementary School, Hazen Union High School, Woodstock Farmers Market, Addison County uh, Fair and Field Days, the Granville Fire Department, and the Johnson Elementary School. Tomorrow, Wednesday, St. Albans City Elementary School, Twin Valley Middle and High School, Oxbow Riverfront Park in Morrisville, uh, the Addison County Fair and Field Days in New Haven, the Waterbury Ambulance in Waterbury Center, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road, that's in Berlin, it's right behind the Burger King, the Rutland uh, Department of Health, uh, the Health District Office in downtown Rutland. On Thursday, Burn Burton Academy, North Country High School, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, Montpelier Parks here in Montpelier, the Retreat Farm in Brattleboro, the Addison County Fair and Field Days in New, ha New Haven again, Waterbury Farmers Market in downtown Waterbury, the Berry Town EMS in East Berry. On Friday, August 13th, the Champlain, Va Champlain Valley Union High School in Hinesburg, Morristown Elementary School in Morristown, the Halifax Community Center in Halifax, the Antique Car Show at Farce Field in Waterbury, the Addison County field, uh, Fair and Field Days in New Haven, the Cambridge Rescue Station in Jeffersonville, the Newport Waterfront Plaza in Newport, and again, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road in Berlin. On Saturday, the Brattleboro Music Center and Retreat Farm. It's a presentation, music, uh, music Under the Stars. It's in Brattleboro. Um, Mountain Marketplace in Loudonderry. Uh, Grand Isle Sheriff's Department in Grand Isle, the Stowe Community Church in Stowe, King Arthur's Baking Company in Norwich. Again, the Addison County Fair and Field Days in New Haven. Again, the Antique Car Show at Fars Field in Waterbury, Canaan High School in Canaan, the Grand Isle Elementary School in Grand Isle. On Sunday, Spalding High School in Barrie. Please take advantage of the many opportunities, and as you saw, there are many opportunities to become vaccinated. And it's just not only people that are going back to school, anybody can visit these uh, clinics and get vaccinated. All it requires is simply a bit of your time. It's only a few minutes of your time. Again, you can find information on all of these locations at the Health Department's website, which is healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. And remember, get tested for COVID if you have any symptoms. Test sites can also be found at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thanks very much. Let me just start out with three key words. Vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. I say that because at this time in our experience with COVID-19, this is the number one thing, the most important action any of us can take. We have a very powerful tool vaccines that are highly effective at preventing the most serious outcomes of the COVID-19 
illness and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, including against the Delta variant. In fact, according to a study led by Yale School of Public Health, the vaccines are estimated to have saved some 279,000 lives and prevented 1.25 million hospitalizations. Even if those numbers are on the high end, that's pretty amazing to consider. Now we know in Vermont, the tool works even better as we have some of the highest vaccination rates in the country. Now, as you heard, at 84.6%, having had at least one dose, better protecting our whole population. And Vermonters have been faithfully stepping up to get their second dose, with the rate of full vaccination now exceeding 75% also a first in the nation ranking. We've learned a great deal about the virus, an almost unprecedented amount in more than 18 months. Unfortunately, one key aspect we know is the virus continues to evolve. And right now, the most contagious version of it, the Delta variant, is firmly established in the country and is found in nearly all of the cases that we have done whole genome sequencing on in Vermont, close to 90%. Because it's so contagious, more than twice that of the original strain, it's quickly moving through our unvaccinated population, causing cases to rise and contributing to more community spread and outbreaks. That means we're seeing rates rise in our communities again, like in camps, workplaces, and other settings. We may be just starting to see the impact on hospitalizations as well, with the majority as expected in the unvaccinated population. It's also leading to some cases in vaccinated people, but again, those people are still protected from severe illness. At the same time, however, our experience informs our knowledge, and with that, our ability to respond and counter the threat also continues to evolve. That's why we want everyone who's eligible for vaccination to get vaccinated as soon as possible, because that protection is how we ensure people are protected. So many Vermonters have been vaccinated, and again, thank you for taking that important step. But there are a little over 80,000 people in the state who have not yet been vaccinated. Some because they're not eligible, but many who are. So to those fellow Vermonters, please know that when we urge you to get your shot, it's because as a physician, as a human being, I don't want you to get sick. I don't want you to end up in the hospital, and I certainly don't want you to die. Getting your shot is also very important if we're going to be able to slow the spread and protect those who are not yet able to be vaccinated. Indeed, I know many of you have heard this message because as Commissioner Pichek showed, we've seen an uptick, not only nationally, but in Vermont, in vaccination demand. And if you look at news of the so-called breakthrough cases as a reason to not get vaccinated, take my re reassurance that this is completely unjustified. About 2% of our cases since January of this year have been among fully vaccinated Vermonters. That's a rate of such infections in the over 465,000 Vermonters. That means less than 0.1% of those who have been vaccinated. So does taking a chance on almost definite risk of getting COVID with a highly transmissible variant or getting a severe illness or a possible long COVID syndrome still make sense or does getting vaccinated make more sense? It's not politics, it's not an agenda, it's public health, medical science, plain and simple. In the meantime, each of us have our own situations and day-to-day -day activities, days into which we once more must incorporate what works best for protecting ourselves, our families, and our communities from the virus. These are the prevention steps you've heard so many times over the past year plus. Wash your hands, stay home when sick, and call your doctor if you have symptoms of the virus. This includes masking. I get lots of questions about masking. If you are not vaccinated, we encourage you to wear a mask in public indoor spaces. This will protect you and those around you. 
And if you're vaccinated and you choose to wear a mask as an extra, extra layer of protection indoors, especially if it's crowded or if you travel, that's okay too. Do what makes sense for you and your personal comfort level. And do so knowing you should not be judged for that. The science hasn't changed. Wearing a mask helps protect you and the people around you from getting or spreading COVID and this current variant. A mask can change your respiratory droplets and can keep them from reaching others. COVID-19 can spread from anyone, even if a person does not have symptoms. And the fact is, many of us have people in our lives we need to protect, including younger children who can't be vaccinated yet, hopefully by late fall or early winter, or those who are older who have weaker immune systems. And unfortunately, some of them are getting COVID and becoming ill. A mask is a temporary, simple, but effective tool we can add to the vaccine to keep everyone safer. But remember, the most powerful tool right now is the vaccine. Finally, a reminder about testing. If you have any symptoms or think you've been exposed to COVID or were in a higher risk situation, get tested. As you've heard, in some parts of the state, demand is higher right now, so it's best to make an appointment if you can. Visit healthvermont.gov slash testing. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with those in the room. Uh, could you enlighten us about the increase in hospitalizations and uh, those in intensive care? Um, are any of those folks unvaccinated and are any children in intensive care? I believe there are some who are vaccinated. I don't believe there were any children who are hospitalized at this time, but I would ask Dr. Levine to elaborate. 100% of the hospitalized patients are adults. And uh, unvaccinated? Yeah, so 75% of the hospitalized patients are unvaccinated. If you do the math, that's 25% of the eligible population to get vaccinated are, are unvaccinated. So what is your guidance to employers who, who see the CDC spread now, as of yesterday with six counties, substantial or high? And they're saying, hmm, we have an 84.6% with at least a first shot. Should we go back to masking or asking everybody to mask inside? Uh, what do you say? Yeah, I think as we've said all along, for an employer, that's their personal choice. They are completely uh, free to expect masking in those populations. Um, when it comes to mandating vaccine, you've heard from the governor this morning, and I'll let him comment further on that, um, but many are joining uh, a growing sentiment that mandating vaccine in their setting is a useful public health tool, and it's a useful business tool to keep their population of employees healthy and to keep uh, their work environment safe. Governor, what? Uh, specific factors triggered your decision to rethink the wisdom of the vaccine mandate for some state employees? I think it's the, uh, the transmissible uh, disease, the variant, um, has shown how quickly uh, that it can spread. Uh, we have an obligation uh, to protect the most vulnerable uh, under our care, and, uh, and I think those in uh, the veterans' home, uh, the psychiatric hospital, as well as the offenders and the correctional facilities, they're under our care. So I wanted to make sure that we weren't, there weren't any holes in our staffing. Um, now, the mandatory uh, vaccination that we're uh, considering uh, will have some sort of an exit ramp as well. It won't be forced. It will be. Um, there, there may be uh, testing involved. Uh, there may be some other avenue uh, so that for those who 
are not willing uh, to be vaccinated. But, um, but we just think it's a good idea considering uh, what's happening, uh, what we're seeing across the country. And I just want to, again, reiterate, uh, we've seen how effective uh, the vaccines are. Uh, you, we, we look at the, the number of cases uh, who are hospitalized uh, at this point in time, which isn't where we'd like to be, uh, but we never said that these were 100% effective. Um, we said the vaccines were 85% effective, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, I believe. So there is some risk involved. But when you look at the, this 99.999% of those who are, have been vaccinated who aren't in the hospital at this time. So those are pretty good odds. So we think it's a good idea for people to get vaccinated. Do you know how many people uh, are, would be required to be vaccinated under your, your plan? I, we, I do not know. Um, I, I don't know uh, what the percentage is. It, it ranges, it's different for different facilities. Uh, some uh, within corrections, for instance, uh, there's a higher number of unvaccinated uh, up in the northern part of the state than in other regions. And is this something you think about expanding to other state employees? Um, let's, we're going to take one step at a time. Uh, again, we want to, and we believe uh, that this, as Commissioner Pichak had talked about, our modeling has shown, and we've seen this throughout the world, uh, that this will subside and start um, um, reducing uh, after seven or eight weeks. So it's not something uh, that uh, uh, we're ready to impose at this point in time. But as we said from the beginning, you know, we we're watching the data, we're, we're listening to the science, we're trying to do what's best uh, for Vermonters. Uh, and uh, at this point in time, we feel that uh, protecting the most vulnerable, those under our care, under our jurisdiction, uh, we have an obligation to try and protect. You today are calling on other Vermont businesses to um, consider a vaccine slash testing mandate as well. Why not take whatever steps you would need to take uh, in order to use your executive authority to compel businesses? We have to reissue the state of emergency, and I'm not willing to do that at this time. There's no need for the state of emergency. Governor, the Chamber of Commerce, um, they have a survey out right now to their member businesses and think who, who will, you know, what, what, taking the temperature on mandating the vaccine, and they're already hearing from some businesses that are saying the opposite of what you're saying, that requiring the vaccine will just be one more hurdle for them to overcome, uh, especially recruiting workers. How, how do you respond? Well, again, that's their choice, um, and uh, we've we recognize that from the very beginning, uh, whether it's uh, customers coming through their door or whether they're, it's their employees, um, they have to do their own risk assessment and decide if that fits their business or not. Um, for many, I think uh, we've seen uh, that many businesses uh, throughout Vermont have imposed uh, this requirement. And uh, so everyone makes a decision for themselves. I mean, this might be for Dr. Levine. I think this has come up before, but is there any progress made on when the state reports um, cases and hospitalizations and deaths, if, if we can differentiate between vaccinated versus unvaccinated, right? Reporting how many breakthrough cases. Some viewers have told me that could actually help uh, increase confidence in uh, the vaccine. Yeah, so in our weekly updates, which are now every other week, but they're still called weekly updates. Uh, we have uh, added several slides that talk about the breakthrough infections. So the data from that is readily available to those who regularly check that. Um, hospitalization data, we're working on trying to perfect that science and getting a good sense, not just for cases, but for actual hospitals, hospitalized patients, what their uh, statuses, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It's a little more challenging than just for the cases. What, what are the challenges to gathering and tracking that more closely? Well, the challenges are that uh, we're dealing with a heterogeneous group of hospitals that have different reporting schedules, that um, some of the data, you know, would be protected data regarding patients. Um, some of the data might not be immediately present because somebody's admitted in distress and uh, 
goes to an ICU and they may not have access to data regarding their vaccination status and we'd have to go to other data sets to try to find that and then combine it in. So. If it is simpler uh, tracking that with cases as you're putting out every two weeks, is there a reason the health department couldn't put out that breakdown among new cases on a more frequent basis than every two weeks? Because I share Calvin's feedback that we're, we're getting sure. constant requests for, for that information. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't do that. Again, I think the focus on it is misplaced. That's my uh, opening comments. Uh, hopefully convinced people. But, but I, I understand people are hungry for information of all sorts. I wanted to also just make a follow-up comment to the governors on the uh, um, vaccines mandating. Um, you know, we're talking about populations that are very vulnerable. So as opposed to the business sector, we're talking about people who are serving vulnerable populations, which is an important consideration. Um, and we have very variable rates around the state. Some very commendable rates in some of our uh, healthcare systems and in our long-term care facilities with staff uh, equaling or exceeding the vaccination rate of the general population in Vermont. And then some notable exceptions in the other direction where they could do better. Uh, so uh, it's a very heterogeneous group, but uh, it's a little different to talk about those caring for the vulnerable than just in general the concept. But uh, you've stopped short of recommending such mandates for K through 12 schools or even licensed child care centers, uh, which are, are, are children who can't be vaccinated considered vulnerable in this context? Our school guidance came out last week and it was pretty clear about, uh, obviously it wasn't clear about mandating vaccine. That wasn't the topic but we've already got a success rate in the education sector that's quite high uh, and paid, paid special attention to that sector early on uh, in our vaccine efforts. Uh, but the guidance was very specific about ways to help protect children uh, as school reopens. But you're saying when we have staff members who are dealing with vulnerable populations, um, we should have a vaccine mandate in place for those people. Why wouldn't that same rationale apply to staff that are working with people who are unable to get vaccinated? Yeah, the head of the, uh, the NEA, I guess I believe it is, nationally, uh, actually has endorsed what you just said. Um, in Vermont, we haven't gone that far. I guess the question is why, why, yeah. why wouldn't you? go that far? Well, I'll let the governor help us Well, again, I think we're that. talking about different situations, yeah. uh, Peter. I mean, you're talking about 24-7 in a psychiatric hospital or in the, the offender population um, or the Vermont Veterans Home, 24-7 in the same building. Um, when we're talking about uh, kids in school, it's not uh, for uh, those periods of time. So we've, um, we've instituted uh, mandatory masking in, in schools for the first two to three weeks, as well as uh, uh, for those who are ineligible uh, to be vaccinated uh, over time. So we think uh, that's the right approach. Uh, getting kids back in school is, uh, is going to be better for their mental health and, uh, and we believe it's a safe approach that we're taking. Uh, your thoughts on your colleague in New York's decision to resign? I just uh, actually saw that. Um, with the mounting credible allegations against him. Uh, I think it was the right decision to make, probably not surprising, um, but, um, but I think it's for the best of, uh, for the people of New York. Secretary Smith, um, what sort of knock-on effects are you anticipating as a result of the expiration of some of these federal unemployment programs, and, and what are you doing? Well, I mean, I think the commissioner has been clear that this could, you know, result in people needing food, housing, childcare subsidies, uh, what have you. And you've got this slug of almost 10,000 people they're gonna be going from not just unemployment, but the $300 weekly add-on to nothing. And I'm just wondering if that's something that's on your radar or anything you're doing to prepare for that. We aren't doing anything special. We've had, um, you know, through our Three, three Squares um, meal program, we've had really 
enormous capacity in that program thanks to the federal government and thanks to um, what we've done here at the state level. So I think from a food aspect of it, I don't think, you know, we're, we're not going to be overwhelmed uh, from that that perspective, from a healthcare uh, perspective, we're not going to be overwhelmed uh, as well. And I'm trying to think through the various programs that we have. We're in pretty good. Sh we're in pretty good shape um, to withstand something that um, uh, may come our way, whether it's uh, virus related or natural disaster or an instance like this. We're in pretty good shape. Just, for, just, keep, just keep in mind, though, that's, we're talking about the $300 stipend, right? But for the people who are on PUA, the whole kit and caboodle right. is going away. And, for the, and, and more than half the people who are on unemployment right now, it, or they're on the extended benefit, so they're losing not just the $300, and, but also the... Yeah, but, but keep in mind as well, uh, we're struggling in every single sector across the state uh, for employees. So. I believe there are opportunities out there. We want to be able to help them find uh, their career path and, and uh, a job in the meantime or whatever may be the combination. Um, so we feel uh, as though, and this isn't our uh, action, this is the federal government's action, but we believe that uh, there are jobs available for those who, who want to work. Governor, uh, maybe for Dr. Levine, too, you know, we, we talk about getting back to cases just for a second, but, you know, in the next couple of weeks, those are slated to come down. But we're hearing more and more about the Lambda variant, Delta Plus variant over in Korea. I just wonder if you could shed some light as to how solid some of these projections are in light of yeah. additional variants. I think uh, Dr. Levine can answer this probably better than I can, but, uh, you know, we see this like with the flu, different variants of the flu, uh, year after year. And uh, we're going to see this uh, with COVID as well in the, in the coming years. Um, that's why it's so important uh, to get everybody vaccinated just as quick as possible to, to create this line of defense so that it doesn't mutate further, right? We, want, we don't want the new variants to grow. We want to shut it off just as quick as we possibly can. Um, I believe had we as a country uh, have been more uh, fully vaccinated, we wouldn't have this situation that we're in today. Uh, and I think that when you see um, states where they have, you know, 30 to 40 percent vaccination rates, this is the result of that. The variants are allowed to grow and mutate and, and change and get through uh, into uh, different populations. So. Um, this is this is a result of that lack of effort in terms of vaccination. Obviously, everybody's watching Lambda and Delta Plus and whatever comes next. None of them are really uh, present in the whole genome sequencing in this country to any degree. I think Lambda was under one percent. So they do bear watching. We don't really know what they're going to turn into. The CDC has this whole kind of gradation of levels of concern. You start as a variant of interest, you become a variant of concern, then you become worse than that uh, if you're like a Delta. Um, just, just to piggyback on the comments that were made about mandating vaccine in different populations, I think it's clear to people, but just to be extra clear, if we mandate vaccine for who knows who tomorrow, that's not going to matter for Delta because the Delta cycle is still several weeks to, in duration. Uh, one dose of a vaccine won't be enough. Um, it's really looking forward to the fall and winter and making sure that if any of the things, uh, Calvin, you're concerned about in these other Greek letters become of a concern, the population will already be prepared to meet them. So I think that's really the, the thrust of where we're going. Dr. Levine, sort of a follow-up to that question. I mean, historically speaking, pandemics end. You know, they, they just disappear. <laughs> well, what do you see happening here? Gee, if I had the answer to that, I'd be on the news shows nationally every night. Um, the pandemic. The kind of what we've been through pandemic, I do see coming to an end. But to piggyback on the governor's answer, 
it's not like coronavirus is going to disappear. Coronavirus is going to be here. Yes, there may be new variants, but maybe there won't be. Um, the bottom line is we can't really predict that with certainty. We're all living through a, our own first pandemic. The one back in 1918 uh, seemed to come to an end, but it didn't come to a grinding halt. If you read more about it, it, it sort of had its tail end lingering. So we're kind of in that phase right now, and we have to be prepared for that. And the best optimism I can give is if the efforts of the current federal administration and other developed nations around the world to get vaccine to developing nations can be successful, uh, we will see more of this ending of the pandemic. Because clearly the variants we've had thus far, especially the Delta, didn't evolve uh, under stress from vaccine uh, on people. They came at times when people weren't vaccinated and uh, were able to continue to freely transmit virus one to another. So we need to really try to put an end to that. And the most successful strategy is going to be improving our rate in this country, but continuing in parallel to improve the rate around the rest of the world of percent vaccinated. Dr. Levine, a couple quick questions about at-home COVID tests from a colleague. Um, she had noticed that there was a sign outside a local CVS uh, saying they were all out of those at-home tests. She was wondering if post-vaccines, or I guess not post-vaccines, but at this stage of vaccinations, if more people are using those, um, how does the state find out about a case in that scenario if they're using an at-home test that they bought at a pharmacy? Yeah, so if the person does not report it to us and the person does not report for medical care, um, that would go under the radar because we would have no idea that they'd even done the test. Um, there's some caveats in that test. So when you do a home test, if you're positive at a time like now and you did the test because you have symptoms, that's a very reliable home test to do. But if you really were worried about COVID and you, did, you had a negative test, there's instructions there about maybe you should actually go get medical care, get the uh, sort of gold standard test, like a PCR test as opposed to an antigen test, and make sure you weren't a false negative on that evaluation. And then, of course, we would have insight into that. We're about the accuracy rate and whether they should get a PCR test. So I think you answered those two. Yeah, although the accuracy rate, again, much better for having a positive result and believing it than having a negative result and being falsely reassured. Uh, but keep in mind, the ones that they're selling at CVS have received uh, emergency use authorizations. So that's important. Governor, can I ask you a question about something else? Uh, Sure. Over the weekend, the National Guard released its uh, report uh, that followed allegations of sexual harassment and some misconduct, as you know. You're a big support. Support. I'm just wondering, in what areas do you want the Vermont National Guard to improve? Yeah, I, uh, I haven't read the report. Uh, we do have it, uh, but I haven't read it uh, yet myself. Uh, but I have a great deal of faith in General Knight. He's made this his mission. Uh, I think he's made great strides in this regard. The transparency that he's shown um, is, uh, has been encouraging, I think, for all of us. And uh, if there's anyone who can get to the bottom of this and trying to, you know, culture doesn't change overnight, and, but he is doing his best uh, to change that culture. And uh, again, I think he's made great strides in that regard. How will you know he's done the job? Well, he'll continue uh, to be transparent and honest and open as he did with this press conference he had um, the other day. And this report will continue uh, to be a, somewhat of a living document uh, and will continue to, to look at um, uh, the, the data and making sure that we're doing all we can. Does it surprise you to hear that the quote, good old boy network uh, is alive and well? Again, culture is very difficult to change in every regard. Um, so I, I can't say that I'm surprised. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. I'm disappointed, um, but, um, but I'm not surprised. I have a couple more questions for Dr. Levine. I want to know, uh, the health department on Friday night notified the public about uh, this outbreak at a Waterbury summer camp. 
Um, I wanted to know if we could get a little more information on where the investigation of that stands, um, as well as uh, one, one basic question about it. Was this camp primarily outdoor or indoor? Do you, can you say anything about the environment that these campers were particularly in from day to day? Yeah, so my sense is, uh, I can't give you this with 100% certainty, that more of it was outdoors than indoors, but that doesn't preclude campers from gathering together indoors. The um, current case number I don't have as of today. Um, and the reason we put out the public announcement was, again, because campers uh, probably in a less or totally asymptomatic state um, were circulating within the community and um, not aware of their infectious status. So we wanted to make sure that people were aware of that. Do we know anything about how uh, the infection spread uh, among that population? Do we know if it came from an adult, uh, whether that adult was vaccinated or not? And does there seem to be evidence of one child spreading it to another child? Or yeah, so these are all great questions from an epidemiology standpoint, and they never are answerable on the first couple of days. Uh, they take time for investigation. They take time for accumulating more people who have gotten tested and seeing what their status is. I can tell you that it's pretty, un, I hate to say un, uncommon, but I think it's true. It's uncommon to often find the index case. So uh, though it's always of interest, um, it's very challenging to do that quite often. I will say that, you know, we are seeing cases in Vermont in all the kinds of settings you'd expect, from workplaces to camps to uh, healthcare uh, and childcare facilities, uh, all the same spectrum as we would have seen at any other point in the pandemic. Uh, that continues. But we do note that people who have traveled in return and people who have a household contact continue to remain um, more uh, vulnerable, if you will, and susceptible to getting infected. Uh, but that's not exactly different than at any other time. How many outbreaks are currently under investigation right now? I don't have the number for today. Um, I can get that to you. Is there a reason that's not reported more regularly uh, for, you know, I know that's in the uh, weekly summary that you were talking about that comes out every two weeks. Is there a reason that the, the public can't get that information on a more regular basis? Well, nothing's being hidden and there's no reason. Uh, I, frankly, it isn't super helpful, um, to be honest. Most of the outbreaks that we see now are of modest size. Vaccine has prevented them from turning into what they would have turned into in a pre-vaccine era. Uh, we see far more what we call situations, which are just uh, a cluster of a couple of cases or a specific site that has a case known that, that concerns us because of the nature of the site. And again, these don't turn into outbreaks with great regularity. All right, I've got to um, move to the phones, starting with Lisa, Waterbury Roundabout. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. All right, we'll try Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. Tom Davis, Compass, Vermont. <coughs> Thanks, Jason. A uh, couple quick questions for you. Uh, Dr. Levine, one really quickly, um, the last time that you spoke to us, you said that nearly 86% of new COVID cases were the Delta variant, uh, if I have my notes correct. Uh, has that changed? It's changed to about 90%. Okay, thank you. Um, Governor, I've been speaking with uh, some spokespeople at the Canadian government, and um, they showed their frustration that uh, that the United States government continues to say that they're working closely with the Canadian government um, about reopening for Canada uh, to come into the United States. 
uh, when the truth is she said, we can't tell you anything, we're ready to go. Um, and uh, she said, I've not heard anything on our end from the United States, but you know, they get the green light. We're basically, we, we're in place to allow Canadians to visit. I know you didn't have your call this week, but I wondered if if you had any intel or even speculation as to what the heck the U.S. is doing. Yeah, I share their frustration uh, as well as uh, lack of understanding as to what the holdup is. Um, again, uh, Quebec, Canada, uh, overall, is in better shape than we are in many regards. Who we uh, they should fear what's happening in the U.S. We shouldn't fear what's going on in Canada, and especially uh, Quebec. So we have not, um, as you know, we, uh, we uh, National Governors Association, along with uh, a number of governors, uh, penned a letter uh, to the White House and asked them for a meeting. We have not heard anything, to my knowledge, at, uh, at this point. So we anxiously await that, uh, but, um, but I, again, I, I have no idea why uh, there's a lack of action in that regard. I, it just seems as though we could have a, a reciprocal type of reciprocity in terms of whatever they're uh, requiring to come across the border into Canada. We could we could do the same for those in Canada to come to the U.S. The um, two Canadian uh, publications were speculating, also Peace and Yahoo News is uh, on the financial side of speculating that one of the issues may be that the, the entire apparatus uh, for the borders was stripped down on the Canadian side uh, significantly during the Trump administration, and they, the U.S. just may not have the resources in place to handle uh, incoming Canadians. Have you heard anything about that? I have not heard. Uh, no. No, I haven't heard that at all. Uh, but I haven't heard anything, okay, to you. be perfectly honest. <laughs> right. Um, Last real quick question. I spoke with the Vermont Air National Guard this morning, um, and they they gave you some information. But I was curious if anyone in your administration has any information about uh, low flying C-130 uh, cargo planes uh, over sent mainly central Vermont from the reports our readers have sent. Uh, when I say low flying, I mean just above the treetops, usually in groups of two or three. It's been going on for over a month. Does, does anybody in the administration know anything about that? Yeah, this is the first I've heard of it, Tom. Um, and I live right here in central Vermont, and I have not seen or heard them. But um, but I'll see what I can find out. Okay, thank you. He, he speculated that it was uh, one of the New York squadrons uh, who do have C-130s. Uh, I actually saw one and got a picture of it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll, be, I'll be checking in with that. But if you hear, if you're people hear anything i always appreciate it thank can't, you can't blame them for wanting to come to vermont but uh i have no other <laughs> info on that okay thanks that's it for me appreciate it cam davis of vermont journal uh, just a question i have a question for dr levine um can you hear me we can go ahead ham uh, i'd like to ask dr levine as much as he is able to uh, tell us what he can uh, know or, or speculate about the, uh, the, the situation that we might get if somebody, if the uh, CDC decides that people need a booster shot. The uh, first shots that were given in, the first shots that were given in Vermont were, uh, were in January and, and February, and there's been some mention in the media that, that once you get past six months that you that, that, that the, the uh, protective effect might begin to fade a little bit. What I'd like to know is, I understand that that decision has not been made, but I very value Dr. Levine's uh, horseback guess, his professional guess about uh, how close we are to that question, and secondly, uh, whether any thought has been given to uh, how the state might deal with that um, if you get a decision that, that the that the vaccinated population needs the needs a booster sure there's a couple of questions wrapped together there um, let's start with the fact that there's really good data that shows that at six months we can continue to rely on the vaccines that we've been given especially the messenger RNA vaccine because 
they were authorized, as you remember, earlier. So we have a little more experience with them over time. The J&J &J came uh, online later than the first two. So uh, there's great data there. There's data that's emerging regarding those who are immunocompromised. Some of that shows that there may be segments of that population, since that's a broad umbrella, that could actually benefit from a uh, booster shot. Whereas other data shows that, unfortunately, though we might think it would do them good, there are many segments of that population that don't seem to benefit from a booster shot. There's also data that's in people and data that's in test tubes. Uh, all of that's being sort of you know, analyzed and synthesized by people in the FDA and elsewhere. But the bottom line is, um, I think the FDA is on a fast timeline to get the full approval of the first two vaccines before Labor Day. You know, they've been under a lot of pressure. They have a lot of data to analyze. They're putting more bodies on the effort to analyze that data. Um, but we may find by Labor Day or sometime that month, uh, we'll have full approval, which will uh, make a big difference when it comes to their next decisions regarding booster shots. Nobody sees the need for that tomorrow uh, or in the next few weeks. Uh, but hopefully we'll have more information from them regarding the timing. Uh, I, I think that um, we could certainly go to the end of the year, uh, which would make it a one-year point for people who got the very earliest vaccine, uh, just again based on the data that's available to review now. But there's so much more data that's coming up. We in, uh, in the Agency of Human Services and at the Department of Health have really been looking at the two populations, those who are uh, eligible for a booster at some point when that time comes, and those who couldn't yet be vaccinated, mainly the under 12. So we have sort of parallel planning processes in place for both of them uh, so that we won't be overwhelmed. Clearly, for the... Um, adult population who might need a booster, uh, we all know that that would be a huge effort and it wouldn't be something that everyone could easily accomplish in the uh, confines of their own doctor's office um, so that all of the systems we probably employed earlier on would come back into play uh, for that effort. But if, you know, again, it might be a very restricted effort. It might be a part of the population that has immune system issues and that would be a different challenge than the whole adult population. So hopefully I answered you well enough without saying too much. Thank you very much. It's to my question. Thank you. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I'm curious, the people that are reaching out to get tested, when they show up to a testing site, are they also given the opportunity at those testing sites to get vaccinated? I don't think all of our sites have been commingled, but that's that's our plan in the future. But I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer. Yeah, Greg, um, we were moving and we are still moving towards having combined sites, testing and vaccine, about 14 of them, maybe even as high as 16 of them uh, situated around the state. We have not dismantled the testing apparatus that we have right now. As you know, we have approximately 15 to 17 sort of testing sites that go on. We haven't dismantled that because we've seen the upsurge in uh, testing that uh, people want so we've we've kept that apparatus in place, but in the future you will see both of them combined uh, testing and a vaccine. Probably in your um, uh, you know uh, healthcare setting, such as a hospital or a urgent care facility associated with a hospital. Okay, um, and secondly, Governor. Uh, as you know, the, uh, some of our counties are, are reaching a, a threshold where the CDC has enacted a 60-day eviction moratorium. I, I'm wondering if there's any concern from your office that there may be at least a small group of people that 
like to see that and and it may actually have a negative impact on public health meaning if they are evicted is that what you're saying greg correct correct um of, of course we're concerned we do have uh we have uh systems in place uh, to help those uh, who have been evicted and, and uh, support for them um, as well. Uh, you know, the court system uh, now will hear these cases and uh, we have to have faith in the judicial uh, process that they'll make the right decisions. But that won't be overnight either. I mean, the courts are, are backed up as well. Certainly. Okay. Thank you, Governor. I'm sure we'll talk to you next week. All right. Thank you. We're going to try uh, Lisa from the Waterbury Roundabout again. Hi there. Thanks a lot, Jason. Does that work now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, one for Dr. Levine, although based on your answer earlier, I'm not sure you're going to have much of this de detail. I just thought I would check. So um, the latest number in the Waterbury outbreak that I received late yesterday was 24 cases. Um, I'm wondering if that, at least if you have a sense of whether all of these cases are among children or if there's other adults that are part of that group at this point. You're right. I can't elaborate further on that, but I can get that information. Okay, thank you. One other question about sort of the process that the health department engages in is whether or not there's some sort of a, a protocol for outreach with the community. One of the things that I'm hearing here is that the folks at the town level here with the rec program and, and, and paying attention to communicating with families um, feel really out of the loop. And they were really surprised to hear yesterday that the case number had gone to 24 from 13 on Friday. Um, they're getting a lot of questions and they don't seem to have like a point of contact as far as, you know, information flowing from the health department to update them. Um, I realize things are moving really quickly and people are swamped, but is, is that something that tries to get worked into the process? Yeah, obviously the priority is communicating with those who have been identified as cases or as contacts and with the camp administration, you know, which is all done very early on. And that continues. Uh, in terms of updates, um, you know, in terms of how the situation is being managed or not managed, obviously we continue to communicate with those in charge of running the operation. Um, it is challenging if you're looking for, you know, a daily kind of case count and a daily uh, advisory for people because the advice wouldn't change. Uh, based on uh, one day's cases versus the next um, from what we would initially have given people on day one. Uh, but I do respect the fact that people are hungry for information when they know that they may have had a family member who could have been exposed, et cetera. Uh, but hopefully they've received the proper advice from the get-go so that they know how their behavior should evolve. Right, good point. Um, and for what it's worth, I, I am hearing that the testing has definitely um, jumped in town in the last few days. People are definitely taking advantage of the extra hours for testing. Um, and it, so that message has gotten out for people to be checking. Um, yes. One other question, maybe this is for the, the governor, and the, the CDC recommends at this point just a recommendation that in areas of high or substantial spread, people be wearing masks indoors and it looks on their tracker at this point that a handful of counties in Vermont tick that box right now including Washington County, Chittenden County. Um, are you looking at that at this point in terms of you know maybe being a little stronger in the recommendations being made to people who are not just unvaccinated but regardless of your vaccination status? I still think it's a uh, personal choice. I think you have to make decisions depending on your risk, uh, who uh, who is in your family, who's in your household, so to speak, and uh, whether you should be uh, going to events inside uh, that where you might pick up the uh, the variant. So again, I think you have to do your own risk assessment and then make your own decision at that point. 
Okay, thanks very much, Governor and Dr. Levine. Appreciate it. Thank you. Leora Angle Smith, Vermont Digger. Hi, this question is for Dr. Levine. Um, I want to know uh, the cases that we do have in nursing homes right now, like what's the distribution of like residents versus staff, folks who are unvaccinated versus vaccinated, anything like that? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a uh, table of data to provide you with at this time. So I, I can tell you though, and this is probably the most important take home message, that situations in nursing homes in August of 2021 is nothing like it was at any point prior in the pandemic. They're not, we're not having uh, abundant cases uh, identified at the same time. We're not having abundant transmission uh, across different uh, physical parts of facilities. And um, when people are identified as positive, uh, fortunately, and not exclusively, but fortunately, the majority of them are already previously vaccinated if they're residents of the nursing home and do not have severe cases. Uh, so it's a very, very different environment. Not to say that it's um, easy street for everyone because obviously when a case is identified, it has implications for visitation, it has implications for uh, the anxiety level that others have, but um, it's a much better situation in the vaccination era than it was previously. Thank you. And a second question about testing. Uh, so the, the volume of testing is not going up because folks are asking or needing more tests. How are the sort of supplies and, and like turnaround times for results? Yeah, so in terms of supplies, um, that continues to be a, um, a metric that we follow every week, several times a week. Uh, every time we have a report out from our health operations center, uh, we get a report out from our facilities about how much reagent they have, how many collection kits they have. <clears throat> so we feel comfortable with that. We have a lot of partners in this effort, many of them healthcare providers across the state. Um, we have no indication that they have run into problems with their supply chain at this time either. Uh, we are seeing an uptick in uh, numbers of tests done on a, on a daily basis, but it's still much less than it was at a time when we were doing a lot of surveillance testing in schools and nursing homes, in uh, hospitals, and um, in long-term care facilities. Um, we do expect there'll be an uptick in some of the surveillance testing as schools reopen because, as you know, we've offered that capacity across the school systems. Uh, we have colleges returning, um, but they are returning almost exclusively to, uh, with policies that are mandating vaccination amongst their student bodies. So right now we're, we're doing fine with that. Uh, with regard to turnaround time, I've heard some reports of people who have had to wait as long as 72 hours, which I thought was a little unusual. I don't know how prevalent that is because we've been really having rapid turnaround times as there wasn't that much demand for testing previously. But even now, uh, the demand is nowhere near what it used to be. So my hope is that most people can still have a 48-hour window of time and get the result within that. Um, I, I, I'll make a point of looking into that further. Thank you, Dr. Levine. I may be able to, to help with that a bit. Uh, we do keep track of that uh, on a weekly basis, and uh, we have enough supply at the present rate. Uh, I believe we have enough of a supply for the next year. Uh, even when we had increased demand for testing, uh, I believe we have about a three-month supply at the at the highest point. Let me just confirm. This is the average number. How, how many is that? It's about 27, 26, 2700. Yeah. Well, yes, we have more than a year's supply uh, at the present rate. All right. <clears throat> Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. I believe my question is for Dr. Levine. 
What can you provide us with in terms of demographics about the people who are hospitalized and who are in intensive care? Do you have any an age range or an average age for both of those groups? So I can tell you that they're adults. Um, I can't tell you too much more at this point, but that's the kind of information that we are working on in terms of all of the data sets we have to draw from to be able to portray to you. But I can't give you that today. Okay, I will look forward to it next week. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Uh, a question for Commissioner PCX. Um, you indicated the pace of new vaccinations was increasing in the last few weeks. Are you seeing that in all regions of the state um, and in particular in the Northeast Kingdom? Yeah, so it's a good question. We looked at it across age groups, so we didn't look at it geographically uh, yesterday. Um, I will say um, at, you know, at glance, it does appear that um, the, the vaccinations are going up relative to, you know, the, the amount of people that are already vaccinated geographically. We haven't done an analysis on that. On the age, we did find that the vaccination rates are going up more quickly in the younger population, so the population that are less vaccinated, particularly 12 to 15 year olds, um, and then you know those 17, 18, and, and then those in their 20s. We can look at that though, Andrew, and get back to you for next week, certainly. Okay, thank you. Uh, while you're at the podium, in your presentation, um, you said we may have several more weeks of daily case growth. Um, uh, and looking at the forecast, uh, does this all suggest that the state could be um, seeing perhaps 200 or more new cases per day um, just as kids are heading back to school? Yeah, so the timing the timing is, you know, I think the timing and then the, the quantity of cases are two different things. And in terms of the timing, it does unfortunately seem like the timing will be at the end of August or the uh, you know early part of September when cases would be at their highest, whether that's nationally, regionally, or in Vermont. Um, in terms of the quantity, how high that could go, you know, right now we're projecting out uh, three weeks and, you know, that would be right around the point when you would hope to start to see cases really slow and start to come down. Uh, and we're looking at, you know, seven day average that's around 140 to 147 cases a day. So um, right now we're about 82 cases a day. So, you know, that just gives you some perspective where we are. Uh, but it does, we do anticipate them growing again over the next three weeks and then starting to come down. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, staying on top on topic, but as a follow up, um, and not sure whether this would be for Dr. Levine or perhaps Secretary Smith or French. Um, given what uh, Commissioner PCAC just said about you know potentially peaking just as the return to school, how aggressive uh, will the surveillance testing that you intend to deploy in schools be to start the year? Um, and have you given any thought to, to looking for ways to? Uh, do surveillance testing among students before they even return to campus. We'll let uh, Secretary French try and answer that first. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, well, I think our major approach is to make it as widely available as possible. Uh, it will be voluntary, but uh, we think it is important to uh, make it widely available and also make it available for those that are also already vaccinated. <laughs> Thanks. I know when you first started the teacher surveillance, the, the, the initial week, you, you tried to do as much of the state as you possibly could and then established a, um, a rolling pattern. Um, uh, are, is there an intent or a plan to, to have that initial push uh, with, with a greater amount and a wider range of surveillance testing at the beginning of the year? Uh, not yet, uh, but we are, you know, again, working really hard to make the testing widely available, and uh, uh, we're seeing a strong response from districts in terms of signing up for that. So we'll make adjustments as necessary, but uh, we do see the 
surveillance testing as a, an important component of our overall uh, mitigation strategy for schools. And is that uh, is that going to be available? Uh, well, how quickly into the semester will that be available? Is that starting week one, week two? How how quickly would, do you intend to get that started? Oh, we're working on it now. So uh, perhaps Secretary Smith could give more on the detail, but uh, we fully expect it to have it deployed at the start of school. Um, could you repeat the question, Andrew? Just, just curious, how early in the uh, in the school year the surveillance testing will begin? Is that is that something you're hoping to get started as soon as kids get back to campus, or will there be a delay? Uh, I think what we're striving for is to make sure that we do it upon their return to campus. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you again next Tuesday.